Good to be here this evening. Morning to many of you, middle of the night to others. And um, that's the thing about living in the West, is everybody else has already had your day. So, we are just about finished with ours. And it's good to be back. Give them just a minute to watch each as they come on. And um, I'm watching to make sure the mic is working. It's working well. So glad to be here. And we have been um, talking quite a bit on... Um, consciousness of humanity and the individual consciousness of a person related to the collective consciousness of the spirit and many people have asked me said are you saying it's like two conscious and no no um, it is the same conscience but one opens you up to the collectedness of the entire universe whereas it's like there's two attributes one of them is for the individual and what you're going through in your personal life every day and then there is a collective consciousness of the universe the spirit and it opens you up into so many things we were talking I think on the last zoom meeting last Friday evening and we were discussing this a little bit how that um, you know they talk about astral projection and they talk about a lot of different things that, that people say and they're starting to come to an understanding that um, you really don't leave your body but what you're doing is you are you are um, migrating or transcending into a a, a broader consciousness um, than what you are as an individual so you're not leaving and going away somewhere you're just tapping into that level of consciousness that's collective much much larger um, than an individual consciousness I remember the time when we were when I was uh, visiting New Mexico and I had uh, I was sitting out, it was on a, um, a morning, and I was sitting out in the woods reading my Bible, and I leaned back, I was on a stump, and then there was a, like a, another one behind me, and I just kind of leaned back on it, and, and pulled my hat down a little bit, I remember closing my eyes, and just within a few seconds, um, I was no longer in, I think it's San De Cristo Mountains of, of New Mexico. I was in our, our assembly in Dayton, Ohio, right there looking around. And um, I told about it back then, and I said I left my body sitting there on the stump, and I went to Dayton, Ohio, and I saw what was going on in, the, in, a, in a fellowship service they were having. And, one of the sisters, she's sitting right here tonight, even seen me there. She looked back and seen me in the assembly when I was, my body was um, on the stump in New Mexico. And I really believe if I, I told about it then, now I believe, I believe it ever bit happened, is ever bit real, but I think what I did was rather than just leaving my body, um, I entered into that collective consciousness of the spirit and became connected with everything that was going on and the most important issue that was going on for me at the time was a service in Dayton, Ohio so I connected into that. I didn't leave my body. I remember when the, when the service was over I even went back home afterwards and I told everybody what happened in the service before um, they could tell me and so many of them were surprised and said, I said, yeah, I, I was actually here. 
Um, well, that was that is a level of consciousness when you break out of the individual consciousness into the into the collective consciousness or the collective spirit. You have your own individual spirit, then you break out into the collective spirit or the wholeness of the spirit. Then you are in the web connected to everything and um, so I remember when I when I was no longer in Dayton um, I, I looked right at my body sitting there on the stump and I actually thought to myself how do I do this like what exactly what's what do I do here and within just I mean, a couple of seconds, it was almost like a little vibration took place. And, and I was just looking back out of these eyes. I was no longer in that other level of consciousness that you want to call it. And astral projective people are beginning to say they believe that they're not really leaving the body. They are just entering into a collective consciousness that connects you to the web all across the universe. So I was thinking about that some, and we've been discussing the individual um, consciousness and how a person is related to the collective consciousness of the spirit. When we're talking about changing consciousness, there's something that arises each time that we have made the change in life there's something that arises through the scripture I was looking through the scripture I was looking through Brother Branham's message many things um, and I was looking through a lot of men Eckhart Tolle and Jim Pullman and and many of the men you know someone accused me of ministering their message Eckhart Tolle's and so <laughs> crazy me I I, I didn't even know who he was. So I went back and I was looking like in the days of Wesley and in the days of Luther. I was hunting for this Eckhart Tolle guy and it kept saying he's alive, living in California. And I thought, no, that's not the guy. They're, they're accusing me of following some religious guy. And I just kept looking and there wasn't no Eckhart Tolle in any other age. He's living and he's alive right here and now. And they said, uh, they said, you're preaching his message. And I said, I didn't even know he was alive. I, I had no, no understanding whatsoever, him or any of them. I thought they were men from a day gone by that they were accusing me of preaching their message. And uh, so I realized then that we are both connected in the web in the consciousness, in the collective spirit, whatever you want to call it. So we were tapping into a lot of the same things. And so I looked him up, I looked up his messages, um, Anna Brown's messages. If you haven't listened to Anna Brown, wonderful things that that lady is saying and some real good messages on, on YouTube. She's usually short messages, not more than 10, 15 minutes long. So. If you're in a hurry and you got things to do and you haven't got long, pull her up. She's, uh, she's great to listen to while you're drinking your coffee in the morning or whatever. And she gets some really good thoughts across. And then there's uh, Donald Neal or Neil Donald Walsh. He's very good. Um, Abraham Hicks. She's, she says some good things. But, you know... When a person is talking, they should be talking from the first person. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm going to tell you something that I see, I'm going to tell you I see it because I see it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, she doesn't do that. Abraham Hick has some good things, but it's like she says, you know, Abraham told me this, or Moses told me this, or this one told me that. Uh, and sometimes it's not so personal. But I've listened to a lot of them. And, and uh, I will probably listen to a lot more because I do believe that every single one of us are connected to the collective consciousness. And it might not be all the time, but some of the time 
we speak from there. All of us, whether no matter who you are, you know, prophets, you know, many of the prophets only had a few little things to say. But what they said came straight from the collective consciousness. They got killed for it and everything else. So I look for those things in each one of us. And if I find it in a rooster crowing, I'll take it. If I find it in a, in a donkey talking, I'll take it. If I find it in a Balaam, I'll take it. Balaam put out some really great prophecies about Israel, whether you like Balaam or not. So, you know, I will take it, whatever is said, for what it's worth, and I will look at how I can apply it in my life, or if it doesn't apply. And then I will take everything I heard and make it work for me, the best that it works for me. If it doesn't work, I lay it aside. So, from the beginning to the end of the biblical civilization, which you read from Adam out into the book of Revelations, from the beginning to the end of the biblical civilization, when major changes are occurring in humanity, there's one thing in the midst that happens almost every time before a major change takes place, and that is eating and drinking and I named this or I titled this a little bit um, eat and drink for the journey and eating and drinking is something that comes up continually we know that physically in order to bring the needed changes to the body of your earth this body eating and drinking is necessary it's very necessary you have to do it in order to live. And I look at, at the biblical civilization and I go to gen the very first uh, of anything about humanity. They're in, a, they're in a spoken word civilization in the Garden of Eden, but they are preparing for humanity and getting ready to step out into humanity and step out of the, the garden condition, so to speak. And we see that it says in Genesis, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? <clears throat> and the woman said back to the serpent we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden so the whole concept of a biblical civilization starts out on eating what you can eat and what you can drink it starts out that way the woman says to the serpent we may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now actually, the serpent, that voice within her, had a little better understanding than she did. Because the serpent said, Now look, God knows that in the day you eat thereof, that your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So, the serpent is discussing a spiritual eating, an eating that will make you wise, will make you will open your eyes will make you god and will make you know what the good and evil the tree of the knowledge of good and evil this serpent was discussing with her a spiritual happening and most of humanity views it as a natural eating and drinking some think she ate an apple some an apricot whatever but we see that the whole biblical civilization 
started out with eating and drinking before a major change took place. For God does know that in the day that you eat thereof, your eyes will be open, and ye shall be as God, knowing good and evil. Talk about a major change. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took the fruit thereof, and did eat, and also gave unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So we're talking about an eating, but eating something spiritual. Eating some knowledge, some word. Eating something that was going to change their bodies, change their way of thinking, change their actions, change the geographical uh, form that they were even living in. They were eating on something that was going to change them completely inside and out and all of their surroundings with them. They were eating on that. She ate it. She listened to the serpent. She said, this is something that can make one wise. This is something that can open my eyes. This is something that's good for food. It's good to eat. It's pleasant. I mean, it had all the right ingredients to want to do it. And she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. Their eyes were both opened and they knew that they were naked. Or in other words, they came to ground zero. I don't think it necessarily means they were running around and stripped stark naked. That's not, to me, that's not what it's saying. It opened their eyes and they knew they were naked or they knew that they did not know a thing about the world that they had just entered. They were naked. They needed to be clothed. They needed to understand. They needed to they needed to begin to experience things all around them and take things in in order to clothe themselves just like you clothe yourself, not with a pair of clothes every day, but you clothe yourselves with knowledge, understanding, education, health, and on and on and on. You clothe yourself every single day. So eating and drinking was what happened in the very beginning of the biblical civilization to make them wise, to open their eyes, and to set them on a track that would bring humanity into existence, an attribute that laid in them that had not yet been opened. And we see where the coming down through time from there, almost every time there was something major to take place, we'll find that this eating and drinking brought them more knowledge, more understanding, everything that they needed to make it through the situation that they were in. It wasn't so much of sitting down at a table, although some of it was, but it, <coughs> it was symbolizing something much greater than sitting down at a table and eating potatoes and, and, uh, and fruit and this and that and the other. Let's look at another one, and we can see this Moses and it came down to the point to where the plagues had fallen people had seen so much going on they had they had accepted Moses as the deliverer they were ready to leave Egypt and Pharaoh was fighting Moses coming against Moses wouldn't let the children of Israel go and they were having a real contrast, a real battle. And so then Moses speaks up and he says, I'm going to, I'm going to, he tells Pharaoh, I'm going to bring one last plague. And he said, there'll be mourning and wailing and wailing through it, uh, throughout the land. And he said, it'll be a plague that will kill all of the firstborn. Now, a lot of people think that that night, here came the death angel and moved through the camp and slaughtered Egypt and they got set free. But read your scripture a little closer. What happened was Moses went back to Israel. 
he had pronounced the, the slaughtering of the firstborn. He had pronounced all of those things. And then he goes back to Israel and he says, I tell you what I want you to do. He said, take a lamb for each house. And he said, put the lamb up, unblemished lamb for each house. Put the lamb up and keep it up for 14 days. So it was, it was 14 days before anything changed in Egypt. After Moses had spoke the word and said, the death angel is going to move through the camp. And in one night, you're going to let us free and we're going to walk out and you're going to want us out of here. And so he goes back to his people, put your lambs up for 14 days, make sure they're unblemished, 14 days for the cleansing of the lamb, and then take the lamb out and slaughter it and kill it and that in the evening time. And at that time, put the blood on the doorposts and the death angel will move through the camp. So here they are, they've gone through 14 days of Pharaoh preparing to stop, e to stop Israel from leaving. Moses telling everybody what to do and they all put their lambs up. 14 days later, they take them out and they're unblemished and they're clean, they're holy, they slit their throats, they kill them, they take the blood, they put it on the doorpost. And that evening, the death angel begins to move through the camp. Well, if we read in Exodus 12 and 11, it says that they've killed the lambs, they've put blood on the doorpost, and Moses tells them, take this lamb and burn it. Burn its flesh, have no water, any of those things in the, only have water to drink, not, don't cook the lamb in anything, water or anything, and burn its flesh, and then take that flesh and eat it and drink. And thus ye shall eat, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And ye shall eat it in haste, it is the Lord's Passover. So Moses was telling them, it's been 14 days. We, you've done everything the Lord told us to do. He's going to move through the camp tonight. So get the blood on the doorpost. Do all these things and go inside your houses. If a house is too poor to have a lamb, then let those people into your house. And all of you stay in the houses together and eat the lamb and have your shoes on your feet. Be ready because there is a change coming. I don't know how it's going to be. I don't know what's going to happen next. But I know this. There's a change coming. They ate and they drank. And they did everything that the Spirit told them to do. And Moses goes on. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night. And will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. So this was a plague that was going to strike anybody that was not under the blood. I guarantee you there were a lot of good Egyptians, good Egyptian people who heard what Moses said and did the same thing and they lived. Their firstborn lived. But he smote any firstborn that wasn't under that blood. And the thing that made the change or brought the change was they came in unity together they came into a feast together, eating and drinking, and brought forth all of the word that was for that day, and they were ready to step out and do anything, and the change began to take place. It's the same thing with you. When you begin to eat and to drink, 
When you do that, there's changes coming. And I'm not talking about going sitting at a table and eating chicken. I'm talking about when you eat of the knowledge and the understanding, when you do what Eve and Adam did, when you do what Moses and the children of Israel did, you are eating with an understanding that something is coming, something is happening. It's all around us now. The change is no longer in the future. We are eating and drinking, making the change happen in us right now. So we see that happening. It happened all through when the spirit was ready to make a major change. I remember one uh, Elijah and Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Elijah had, had gone up to Mount Carmel. He had put out the barrels of water. He had slaughtered the bullock. He had mocked them while they were trying to bring fire down on Balaam's sacrifice. And it come down to the evening time and Elijah set it up and when he set it all up, down came the fire. I always thought it was interesting that if you read Elijah's prayer at that time, it was 63 words long. I always thought it was interesting that 63 is when the fire came down in, uh, in Elijah's ministry again. But Elijah's there and he smites all of Baal's prophets and all of Jezebel's prophets. There wasn't only 450 Baal, Balaam prophets or Baal prophets. There was also 450 prophets of Jezebel that were there. 900 prophets. And Elijah brought the fire down and smote them all, killed them. And so then he tells Ahab, you better get down off the mountain. Um, and Gehazi sees the the uh, the rain cloud first time in three and a half years and it began to blow and bring up clouds and Ahab was his chariot was running down the mountain and Elijah with the spirit of the Lord upon him outran him and was going faster than the chariot so there then Ahab goes and tells Jezebel all that Elijah had done in the 19th chapter and with all how he had slain all the prophets. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah. Can you imagine this? A man that had just done all that. Number one, who would be stupid enough to send a messenger to him and warn him about anything? But number two, what in the world was he doing? That he got scared. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. So she said, In 24 hours, within 24 hours, I'm going to kill you. And when he saw that, he rose and went for his life. Elijah went on the run. After all of that major moving, and bringing Israel into its unification. All of those things. There was something major getting ready to take place. There was a great change taking place. When he saw that, he ran and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, came and sat down under a juniper tree. Elijah just called on three and a half years of famine, then called it off and brought the rain, killed 900 prophets, and he's on the run from a woman named Jezebel and hiding out. So he went a day's journey, got under the juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die and said, it is enough now, Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And as he laid and slept under the juniper tree, behold, I think this is, this is amazing too, it seems like every single time that this eating and drinking takes place, 
It's an angelic being involved in it. <laughs> when Moses, it was an angelic being that took them out of Egypt, and you know the whole story. And here we are again with Elijah, and he laid under the juniper tree, and an angel came and touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baked on the coals, and there was a cruise of water, eat and drink, laying at his head. And he did eat, and he drank. And he was so weary, he laid down and went to sleep again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat and drink, because the journey is too great for thee. So there was something that was coming for Elijah that he needed the strength and the food of an angel. That cruise came from the angel. That food came from the angel. He needed angelic food to eat and drink in order to make the transition that was coming for him. He was headed right straight into it. And we know what that transition was. He was raptured and caught away. So we see that eating and drinking brings an angelic being on the scene and it feeds us or gives us an angelic nature. You know that what you eat, you become. And it feeds us and gives us that angelic nature. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the streets of that meat and that drink 40 days and 40 nights. Now we all know what 40 is. It's a judgment. So Elijah was able, through the eating and drinking of that angelic food, Elijah was able to make it through the judgments of the Lord that were happening all around him. Now we read on, and the, he, the angel took him to a cave. And there the angel of the Lord, the voice spoke to him, and um, he's seen fire and he's seen different things and, and, and the voice spoke to him just a little still small voice and told him what to do it told him said go and anoint Elisha in your stead and anoint Jehu as king in Ahab's stead and anoint Hazel as king over Syria so he tells Elijah to do all these things and Elijah begins to, he makes his moves to go and he finds Elisha. And you know it said he was in the field and he was, he was uh, working the oxen and so forth and he makes a call to Elisha and Elisha hears the call and he burns his oxen, he gives sacrifices, tells his mother and father goodbye and he goes with Elisha, and you know what he does? He goes to the rapture of Elijah, and Elisha stays right with him all the way to that rapture. But I don't read anywhere where Elijah anointed Jehu, nor did Elijah anoint Hazel as king over Syria. He didn't do it. Now the Spirit of the Lord told him to do it in the cave, and he told him to anoint Elisha, and that's what he did. But he didn't go to the other two. But you know who the, who the one was. Elisha, we know what our prophet said, and you can just look in the scripture. Elisha was just a continuation of Elijah's ministry, which is what we're in today. We are in Joshua was a continuation of Moses' ministry. Elisha was a continuation of Elijah's ministry. Jesus was a continuation of John the Baptist's ministry. So you see all those things happen, and we see here that Elisha is the one that went and anointed Jehu and went and anointed Hazel to be king over Syria. I mean, when I remember reading when he anointed uh, Hazel to be king, he told Hazel he would take the throne and he would kill the present king. And Hazel even looked at Elisha and said, Am I a dog that I would do such a thing to my king? 
But you know what? Elisha knew that his word, that seed, had already been put into Hazel's mind. That the Lord wanted him to be king. So Hazel begins from that point on thinking about it day after day after day and slow but sure went in and done exactly what Elisha told him he would do and he killed the king and he took the throne and Elisha anointed Jehu and of course you know what Jehu did he went and slew Jezebel and you know the story of Ahab how he was shot with an arrow and died and the blood ran out and the dogs licked his blood so Ahab, Jezebel and and um, and the king of Syria they were all taken care of in the ministry of Elijah through the continuation of Elisha and we read where that before all of that happened they went into eating and drinking angelic food death angel in Moses day this angel to Elijah in his day we find out that this spiritual eating and drinking brings a change in humanity it brings a change in the world it brings a change in the universe it brings a change in your body. If you sit down naturally and eat and drink, it brings a change in your body. You eat and drink the right things, it'll bring great change in your body. There's another place, Daniel. And they were, the king was looking for people to serve him in the Babylonian uh, kingdom. And so he said, I want you to take these men Daniel and his three servants, Shadrach, Meshach, and Mendigo. And I want you to take so many of the Chaldeans and I want you to put them all together and I want you to feed them all the foods that I eat, the dainties, the, the beautiful, the great things, the, the best of all things. I want you to feed it to them. And after three years, we will look at their countenance and we will make a decision who serves me. And so we read where that Daniel said, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days and let them give us pulse to eat. Daniel says to the, to the king's messenger, We don't want his foods. We don't want his dainty foods. We don't all want all that stuff. You give us pulse to eat. You know what pulse is? It's the, it's the pulp of things like oranges and grapefruit and that pulp that's inside it's the it's the uh, all that after you get rid of the juices he said give us that to eat that pulp that that pulse to eat and water to drink that's what we want and you don't have to wait three years <laughs> then let our countenances be looked upon before thee and the countenance of the children that, that eat the portion of the king's meat as thou seest and deal with us accordingly. If it doesn't work, we won't be your servants. And he consented to them in this matter and proved them for ten days. And at the end of ten days, eating and drinking, at the end of ten days, Daniel a prophet his words and everything that he said, they followed it. And at the end of 10 days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. So at the time of a change, at the time when Babylon was ready to be conquered, Babylon was ready to fall, Daniel had already made the prophecy that 70 years and we're going out Daniel knew it was the year. He knew it was the time. And he changed their bodies. He changed their thinking. He changed everything about them. He said, our countenance, our thinking, everything will be greater than anything that you do with the king's meat. And they did it, and it happened. And the scripture said, and at the end of the 10 days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh. Then all the children that ate the portion of the king, thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and their wine that they should drink 
and gave them the pulse. And for these four children, God gave them knowledge, eating, and drinking. What the Lord has given us for the word for the day, and the Spirit gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and in all wisdom, and Daniel had understanding of all visions and dreams, and those four men became the mightiest four men in Babylon because they ate and drank what the Spirit of the Lord told them to eat and drink instead of taking the very best of everything that Babylon had. And we have the same thing that happens to us. What do you want to eat and drink? That's my question to you tonight, this evening and morning for some of you. Middle, what are you eating and drinking? Exactly what do you want to eat and drink? Are you eating and drinking something from a day gone by? Are you eating and drinking something that, uh, that doesn't give you the freedom, the agility, the skill, the understanding, spiritually speaking, that doesn't give you all these things? If you're eating and drinking something that fills you up with rules and regulations and, and, and all sorts of different dogmas and creeds and men's ideas and all these kinds of... If you're eating and drinking that, you know what's going to happen to you. You know it's not going to give you the knowledge, the skills, the understanding. Any of these things that you need in this day and age, it won't give it to you. Eating and drinking means everything. It shows up right at the start of great changes throughout the biblical civilization. It shows up. There's another place. There was a great feast. And they were eating and drinking. And the king called his queen out, Vashti, king of Hacerus. Calls his queen out, Vashti, and wants to present her before the world and she won't come out. She didn't come out. She angered the king. She angered the elders. They put her away. They canceled the feast. It was all done. And a year later, they had another feast. And during that year, they took so many virgins in and they began to feed them, eat and drink that was for those ladies so that their flesh and their countenance and their understanding and everything about them would be the very best so they could go before the king and the king could make a decision over who was going to be his queen. So they ate and they drank. And then it came a year later, they had a great feast and all of Babylon and Ahasuerus and, and all of them, they came in and had a great feast and, and the king had chosen... Esther as the queen to be and he calls her out and it's called Esther's feast and they have this great feast and Esther was more outstanding than all the other virgins what she was eating and drinking give her more understanding more knowledge more of everything because all the others wanted certain things. Go back and read your scripture. They wanted to eat this. They wanted to eat that. They wanted to wear this and that. And they weren't listening to what the messenger had to say. And at the end of the year, when they was getting ready to go before the king, they asked Esther, said, what do you want? She said, I only want what the king's messenger wants me to have. So they only gave her that. And you know what? All the others had all sorts of things. They went in and it wasn't, uh, it wasn't good for them. But when Esther went in, the king fell in love with her. He seen her, he seen all of his desires coming out in her through eating and drinking and accepting what he had for her. Same way with the spirit. It'll do you the same way. You want to, you want to have knowledge you want to have wisdom. You want to have understanding. Eat and drink. This is all yours. This is your great feast. Eat and drink. Learn. Have knowledge and understanding. Pay attention. Everything was made. Your prophet told you, he said, the, the, the human being, everything in life was made off of the structure of the human being. The paw of a bear, 
the you know and he just went on and on and on all the things about all the different animals and how that each animal had an instinct of humanity in it eat of these things they're all yours it's all for your understanding and here in Esther she did and she became the queen and delivered her people we find out <clears throat> in Luke 22 when the hour was come he sat down with his 12 disciples and he said unto them with desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer for I say unto you I will not eat any more I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God I won't eat with you again after this until the kingdom of God comes that's what Jesus is saying so we see this now he sent his couple of his disciples out because it was getting down to one of the greatest changes that would ever take place in all of humanity. It was coming down to where we were going to leave the Adamic world and move into the Jesus world, into the spirit world. We were leaving the world of death and stepping into the world of life. We were leaving the world of sin and stepping into a world of righteousness. It was the greatest change that was ever going to take place in humanity. And Jesus sends his disciples out and he says, go. And he said, you'll find a man carrying a pitcher of water. Well, that would be the Aquarian age. A pitcher of water, a man carrying it. And he said, when you find this man, ask him where the room is at for us to have our last supper. Jesus was preparing to eat and drink with his disciples before he made the greatest change in all of humanity. It has a great noting. We need to understand that coming together, that's what eating and drinking is about, coming together with one another, fellowshipping with one another, enjoying one another, paying attention to what each one of us say. We'll look in just a minute at what we're supposed to be eating and drinking. I keep telling you, eating and drinking is the best, but I'll show you what we're supposed to be eating and drinking today in this great feast that we're living in so the hour came they find the man he takes him to the room it's all furnished they go get Jesus and he said unto them with desire I've desired to do this for I say unto you I will not eat any more thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God so we see this going on And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. Now you heard that. Jesus said, in the last supper, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God has come. For I say unto you, I will not. And then he took the bread and gave thanks and break it and gave it unto them saying, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. So Jesus was sitting there going through a natural eating and drinking and the whole time relating it or bringing it over in, in that natural eating and drinking was just a symbol, an allegory of bringing it over into the spiritual. I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. This is my body which shall be broken. Well, they weren't sitting there eating his body. <laughs> all those things, but Jesus was relating it, pulling everything that was going on in the eating and drinking naturally, bringing it over into the spiritual and saying, you won't have communion with me again until the kingdom of God has come. 
and then we'll have communion again. Likewise also the cup. This is my blood. So we see where Jesus eats with them, drinks with them, and then the change begins to take place. They take him from the garden. They beat him almost to death. They hang him on Calvary. All the disciples split and run. They all go every which way. Some of them deny him. Everything else happens, and Jesus is going through all of this great change, and just prior to it, he's found in the Garden of Eden, I mean right, or the Garden of Gethsemane, right after they're finished eating, he's found fellowshipping with an angel, or it said with angels. And the angels were were encouraging him, encouraging him in spirit, like I talked about last week, encouraging him on what to do, encouraging him on keeping himself together and go through this thing. And he was getting encouragement from angels because every time we eat and drink, we're finding out that the angels are there and it's angelic food. Kind of makes you wonder who the serpent was, doesn't it? <laughs> he might have been an angel. <laughs> might have been an angel that fed them this angelic food i won't go there though tonight maybe another night uh, i know sometimes it's too much for people but i do love that serpent <laughs> he means everything to me oh no well yeah jesus said he as a serpent he would hang on a cross paul said he became our sin that we could become his righteousness if if he wasn't the serpent on the tree I mean, that's who he was. The serpent in the garden became the serpent in the tree. Angels all over the place disguising themselves to show us who we are. So here we are. We see all of this happening. As Let's read in John 21. Jesus very emphatically says, I will not eat and drink with you again until the kingdom of God has come. He dies. He resurrects it's some days later and as soon then as they were come to the land it's some days later and they're out fishing and they're not catching anything and a guy on the shore yells and says have you caught anything no you said well cast on the other side and it almost broke the nets and immediately Peter recognized that it was Jesus he girded himself jumped in the water and went running and the others too, and they come to Jesus on the shore. And as soon as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon, and bread. So Jesus is fixing fish and bread for them. Jesus says, and then bring the fish which ye have now caught. So they brought the fish he had caught, and the fish he had there. Simon went up, drew the net to the land, full of the great fishes, 150. Jesus says unto them, come and dine. He's sitting there eating and drinking with them. Come and dine. We see this now. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou? Knowing he was the Lord. And Jesus then cometh and taketh the bread. So Jesus is eating. He's drinking. He's taking the bread. He's giving it to them. And they're all dining. But I read where that he said at the Last Supper, I'll not do this with you again until the kingdom of the Lord comes. Till the kingdom of God comes. And here we are. And all the way up into the third testament. People still waiting on the kingdom of God to come. When Jesus showed that it had come already. It had already happened. The kingdom of God was here. He had died resurrected. And brought the kingdom of God into the earth. A kingdom of life. A kingdom of the second Adam. He brought it into the earth. And so we see all of these things the natural that's going on many times runs us right into it. It's a symbolic uh, allegory or a metaphor of what should be happening in the spiritual and eating and drinking going on that will carry us further in the revelation, further in the understanding, that will, that will give us more knowledge, that will give us all the things that we need in order to live and function in the day that we're in. Paul goes on, Corinthians 11. For I have received of the Lord that which is also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night which you betrayed, took bread. We just read it. When he had given thanks, he broke it and 
take, said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup which he had supped, saying, This cup is a new wine, a new testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do so, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. And everybody immediately said, Oh, we gotta we gotta eat some unleavened bread and we gotta drink some wine. We we gotta do this because Paul said, Do it till he comes. <laughs> well, I read where he came all the way back then in John 21 and began to eat and drink with him. What are you doing? Uh, still showing remembrance of the Lord's death when it's it's completely gone, it's over with and done, and we are living in a kingdom of life, and you're still sucking on wafers and orange juice or grape juice or whatever it is. Lord, help us all. We're supposed to be in a communion. That was just a symbol, and Paul only said, do this in remembrance till he comes. Well, Paul knew he had already come. He knew it had already happened. Paul said it in Thessalonians in many places. So he was showing them that that communion on that evening was a commemorance or a memorial of what Jesus did before his resurrection. And after his resurrection, there's no need of doing it. But people do digress. For as often as you do it, do this till you show the Lord's come. So... We see this happening all the time. People all the time living off something from the past. Moving in something in the past. Never living up to what's going on in their day and in their age. Now the Great Supper, the Lord's Supper, what many throughout the message and everywhere else are calling it the Wedding Supper, the great supper of the Lord, the wedding supper, that they're all waiting on, that they're going to fly away, and they're going to go to a table 1,500 miles long, and people are going to be uh, eating and drinking potatoes and, and fish and chicken, and, and uh, not supposed to be any death there, but we're going to eat all that. And so, so we see this going on. We see what they think it is, but that's not the supper of the Lord. That is, that is not the supper of the Lord whatsoever. The supper of the Lord is what we eat, spiritually speaking, in communion one with another. That's the supper of the Lord. The great supper, the Lord's supper, that we term the wedding supper, a three and a half year supper, all the three and a half years represented was the Messiah sign, so when the Messiah sign comes, the supper's on. That's what it was about. And who had the Messiah sign? Lord, that was 55 years ago. The Messiah sign came. We should be in the Lord's Supper if we know anything about the Scripture whatsoever. We should be eating on the Lord's Supper right now. There's something we should be eating on right now that is the Lord's Supper and it will change us in so many ways, in our understanding, in our thinking, in our knowledge, in everything about us. The Great Supper, the Lord's Supper, it's found in Revelations, if you want to read it. Revelations 19, 17 to 20. And it is a true feast that we are eating on today. The real communion that each of these times that I just went through were symbols and allegories and metaphors of. You know, even Abraham, when he won the battle of Sodom, it was a metaphor. He met angels on the road and they supped with one another. I could just keep going through those things. It's throughout the scripture. But in Revelation 19, and I saw an angel standing in the sun. How many knows who that angel was? Brother Branham was very clear that that was the seventh angel. Now, I don't know who you, who, who all's out there listening to me, I don't know who you think the seventh angel is, but for me, William Branham was the seventh angel. So when I read this, I'm reading about him. 
And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. So there was a call made, go to the future home, see if, if he didn't think it was his ministry. He says in the future home, this message is the call to the wedding supper. Go read it for yourself. This message is the call to the wedding supper. The wedding supper is the great supper of the Lord. This message is the angel of 19 and 17. And we read about this angel and how that he is, is standing in the sun, the complete sun, no shadows, flying in the midst of heaven, and crying, come and gather yourselves. He had a ministry to do it. He had healing. He had, he had so many things going on. He raised the dead. He cast out devils. He brought out the secrets. He brought all the lost things back. He brought all the secret things out. He was, it was such a ministry, such a, a, a magnificent performance that it drew all heaven and earth together. And then he began to cry, Come and gather yourselves unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings. What are we supposed to be eating today? What's, what are we going to eat in the great supper? That ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and them that sat on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. Now you can take the interpretation of uh, Donnie Reagan and he'll tell you that we're all going to come flying back out of heaven on white horses with swords in our hand and we're going to start whacking the heads off every king and captain and, and, and mighty men and, and we're going to slaughter everything and we're going to take over this world in a great millennial reign. Well, you can take that interpretation if you want to. It's totally left up to you. But for me, for me, the angel is William Branham. He brought on the call to the to the supper of the Lord, the great supper, the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he called them all to him that ye may eat kings and captains and mighty men and, and their horses, horses just being power. And them that sat on them, the flesh of men and free men and bondmen, we, we, we can eat it all now. It's all ours and you and me, we are the kings and the captains and the great ones sitting on those horses. And we eat from one another. I eat from you. It's very seldom that I ever go get a message from a book anymore, from a Bible, from a, from a message book or anything else. You know what I do? I, sat I sit down and I go through and I look at all the things that Brother Isidro Estrada and Joe Gomez and and uh, Antonio and and I could just keep naming them on and on and on. Enrique and and the brothers in Africa and the brothers and uh, I sat down and I just read through what they're saying and I look at it all and I think these brothers are in the earth today. They are eating the flesh of kings and captains and men and they are kings and captains and men in the earth right now. And what are they saying? And I take a look at all of it, and I say, oh, this is good, and this is good, and this is good. And I take from all of them, and I eat from the kings of captains and men and everything else. I eat from those women and men. All of us are speaking this word together. And I eat from it, and I come here with that idea in my mind because I want to feed you fresh meat from the straight from the king's table, straight from... Straight from the angel's food, I want to watch your nature change. I want to see your thinking change. I want to watch you grow in understanding and knowledge and wisdom. I want all those things to happen to you. So I am eating the flesh of kings and great things 
in the earth today. That's what we're supposed to be eating. This is a great supper of the Lord. And now I ask you again, what are you eating on? <laughs> Where are you going to get your message? What are you listening to? The message inside, the message outside. We were talking the other day and somebody, uh, if Brother Branham, I think, made the statement. He said, which is greater, the angel in heaven or the angel in the pulpit? Of course, he said the angel in the pulpit has the greater message than the angel in heaven. Well, we move further along than that now, and I'll ask you the same question but in a different way. Which is greater to you, the angel in the pulpit or the angel in you? Which is greater? I would dare say the angel in you is the greatest thing that you can possibly have. We are angelic, and we have the angel in us now. I love men. I love kings. I love captains, and I eat from them all the time. And you know what I'm doing? I'm eating angels' food from them, angels' food from women and men and, and botany life and and animals, they, they give me signs all the time. I see things and I understand things. So we see this. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. So when you begin to eat on this great supper, a change starts happening. Now, I don't, I don't think I'm reading about a whole bunch of kings that got on horses, over, white horses over here and they started riding behind Jesus and, they was going, and then a whole bunch of others got on black horses over here and they started riding against Jesus and they have this big battle. I don't think we're reading that. I think what we're reading about is what's going to go on in you after you begin to eat the supper of the Lord. And when you begin to eat the supper of the Lord, I saw the beast. The beast is me. I saw the beast. I saw the king of the earth. That's me. I'm the king of my earth. I saw armies gathered together to make war against them that sat on the horse and against his army. So I felt conflict. I felt, I felt contrast. I felt all these things going on because of what I'm eating. And he said, we have all of this going on and we feel this thing that's happening and we got to come to a conflict resolution we got to come to we got to come to something that that will resolve the issue in us because these two these two powers are riding in us these two attributes and the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshiped his image and these both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone the change began to take place you the one on the horse the observer that says i'm taking over this earth now he begins to take everything about the beast and begin to cast it into the lake of fire you know what the lake of fire is it's the holy spirit he begins to recast all of that begins to bring it in in a different way all those that were serving you with rule and regulation and government and politics and education and everything else, you begin to change and you begin to say, I don't so much need all that. What I need to do is eat on the kings of flesh and the captains and I need to eat on the, on the supper of the lamb. I need to come to this great understanding and let all of that other stuff go. And the beast, he begins to go through that lake of fire. It's just you. It's not something out there, you know, that's squealing and crying and burning and going to die someday. That's not it. It's me and you. And the beast was taken with him, the false prophet. They're, they're put into that lake of fire, of brimstone, and it begins to purge and change. When you're eating on the flesh of kings and captains, on the flesh of one another, and eating on the great supper of the Lord, it's going to change you. It's going to bring a change. The beast is going to change. All the rules and regulations are going to go away. All these things are going to be dropped. You're doing it right now. It's happening right now. It's not a future thing. It's not a past thing. It's now. 
and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse. So everything that's left over, <laughs> everything is left over from the old, then he that's on the horse, he that's taken control, put the beast and all of his prophets and everything else through the, through the brimstone and the fire and changed and come out pure as gold, then he's going to take even the little remnants and he's going to slay all of it too. So it's a process. It's not a miracle. It's a process of time working inside you. It's the devil purging you of the devil. Because <laughs> the devil is processes and is purging you by processes and bringing you greater. Slay them with the sword which proceedeth out of his mouth and all the fowls filled with their flesh. We're the fowls of the air. We're the eagles. We're, we're it. And we fill up with the flesh of this great supper, eating and drinking for the age that you're in, for the time that you're in, for the message that you hear. Eating and drinking will change your thinking, your knowledge, your wisdom, your understanding. It'll make you as wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. It will give you things pleasant to the eye it will, it will give you things that will make you know that you're God. It will give you things that you'll be able to discern and understand good and evil. It'll, it'll give you all of these things, this angel that come to you. Everyone else will call it a serpent <laughs> because they don't want you to start enjoying yourself and depending on yourself they don't want you to walk away feeling good about yourself like you don't have to have them. They don't want that. Well, I don't have to have anybody. I want people. I don't have to have any. I want them. I want, to, I want to enjoy them and be with them. And whenever it comes a time that <clears throat> they're not so enjoyable, whoever you may be, you, you'll probably see me slip out because I don't like to be around things that I don't enjoy. So this is a great time. We're eating, we're drinking, we're understanding what we're eating and drinking. It's one of the greatest times of our lives. It's one of the greatest times of all life is right now. <coughs> you say it doesn't look great. That which remaineth is greater than that which faded away. We know that. Love bless you. I've been trying to make these things just a little bit shorter. So I've enjoyed it. I hope I can help you. Eat and drink on kings and captains. Say, who are those people? <coughs> those of you that have this great understanding. Listen, catch it, it's everywhere. Love bless.